Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. Um, my name is Carsten Michel. I'm working as a senior expert in network engineering at Deutsche Telekom. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Deutsche Telekom, we are the largest service provider in Germany and one of the biggest in Europe. Uh, today, I will give you some insights into the project Access 4.0, which is the first project using disaggregated routing and BNG system within Deutsche Telekom. Uh, I do this presentation together with Hannes Kretler uh, from our collaboration partner, Archie Brick. So our journey into disaggregation at Deutsche Telekom started a couple of years back when some people of our architecture team investigated the AT&T's CORT approach. Uh, CORT stands for Central Office Rearchitecture as a Data Center. And as the name implies, the basic idea of CORT is to replace an existing black box in the access and aggregation network with uh, bare metal servers and bare metal switches and run open software on top of it. Uh, for us, CORT was the starting point. We have developed our own solution, which meets our requirements, fits into our existing network, and also fits in our existing OSS and BSS systems. For example, CORT has a centralized SDN approach using OpenFlow. However, in our network, we have a huge amount of network states, which cannot easily get, which we cannot easily get rid of, and which are difficult to handle with centralized SDN concepts. Therefore, we built a hybrid SDN solution. Today, our network consists of roughly 1,000 points of presence across Germany. In these points of presence, we, we block network gateways, BNGs, for some time to terminate customer traffic, which is uh, mainly IP over PVPoE. Customers being residential customers as well as business customers on the same platform. The main aim for Access for the Node project is to provide high-speed internet services with triple play support, um, but also business services in the future. And in order to provide this in a very cost-efficient way, uh, and also preventing vendor lock-ins, we've decided to disaggregate software and hardware. Our goal is to get an open architecture, which allows us to replace any component at any time, and also allows us to integrate these components easily into our IT landscape. Therefore, we've built a disaggregated BNG solution together with Archie Brick, which is now live in our production network. We are highly looking for collaboration in the service provider community, especially with other ISPs in Europe and in the US, which have similar ideas and similar needs as we have. We've also contributed some uh, of our work already to standardization groups, as you can see on the slide, and we will continue to do so. My name is Hannes Gredler. I am the CTO and co-founder of Artibrake. Starting about in 2012, I've witnessed uh, data center operators to transition their sourcing strategy away from integrated systems uh, towards bare metal switches uh, plus a disaggregated NOS, mostly to get back flexibility and cost savings. Along with the uh, proliferation of merchant silicon, uh, we have seen many uh, networking operating systems, mostly around uh, um, a DC data center feature set, but none really targeted uh, to a classical telco footprint. Therefore, I wanted to close uh, that gap and founded the company together with uh, my co-founder, Praveen Bandakar, who was my product manager at uh, Juniper Networks. RT Brick and Deutsche Telekom paths have intersected in 2017 uh, with an interesting problem to solve. DT have deployed thousands of chassis based routers. If you zoom inside the box, uh, you'll see core facing line cards, customer facing line cards, all interconnected wire fabric cards. The cards pass traffic using a proprietary data plane protocol, and the line cards are getting programmed using a proprietary control protocol. Now, the problem with this setup is that there is no uniform compatibility layer 
both for the data plane and the control plane. Of course, you kind of combine, combine a line card of vendor A with a line card from vendor B. Worse, you often cannot combine line card version one from vendor A with line card version two from vendor A. And uh, this uh, r typically requires ongoing forklift upgrades uh, during the life cycle of the equipment. And uh, in fact, uh, there is several hardware teams who swap components uh, every single day. So what we did is to create uh, essentially a discrete version of that integrated router. The proprietary fabric protocol has been replaced with Ethernet, uh, MPLS uh, segment routing, and the control plane has been replaced with uh, BGP labeled unicast uh, plus segment routing extension for the underlay. And uh, BGP L3 VPN and BGP MVPN for the overlay. On the management plane, we ensure that each of our smaller switches has a local x86-based board uh, with all the local protocol support to run autonomously if uh, there is, let's say, loss of connectivity to the SDN controller. Yet, as you see, there is a controller who provides uh, high-level instructions, which I'm talking about in two slides from now. Okay, in the very beginning, we had a look at a completely virtual last BNG solution, but found out that running these kinds of services on standard data center servers does not really meet our requirements, especially not in terms of QS support and power consumption. Therefore, we started with an off-the-shelf switch because we believe that we need a dedicated data plane component. We also spent some time investigating different types and different vendors of merchant silicon, and we still do so. Uh, as of now, we've decided to start with Broadcom's Trader DNX ASIC family because they best meet our requirements in terms of scaling. Scaling means route scaling as well as subscriber scaling, and in terms of QoS. In Deutsche Telekom, we extensively use hierarchical QoS, which is not easy to implement with most chips on the market. Starting back in 2018, 2019, we used standard edge core white box switches with Broadcom Kumam MX and a knowledge based processor on board. The Kumam MX chip provides a sophisticated traffic manager that allows us to implement our hierarchical QS schema. The Kumam MX also provides enough throughput for our use cases, and the FIP size is sufficient for most internet applications. In addition, the knowledge base processor is used for a lookup table extension uh, to support a large number of match rules that we need, for instance, for subscriber access lists, statistics counters, service queues, etc. Uh, currently, we are looking into the next generation of switches with higher port density. We are actively working with some OEM vendors on the design of these switches, which will be based on Broadcom Kumam 2C silicon. The increased performance of this ASIC allows us to implement the routing stuff, including all the services we've planned so far, without any KBP, at least not on the spine switches. For the leaf switches, we are still investigating if the next generation KBP is necessary or not. Again, we do not want to have hardware which is specifically built for Deutsche Telekom only, we are looking for commodity hardware to split the development costs across a larger group of uh, interesting carriers. Uh, let's have a look how the network design looks like in more detail. Uh, first of all, we do not have a greenfield environment at Deutsche Telekom. We cannot really start from the scratch. We have neighboring systems which we need to connect with. Uh, the basic access for the row pod consists of spine and leaf switches. Uh, traditional data centers normally use three-stage gloss fabrics because they have a huge amount of traffic which is flowing from east to west. However, in a telco environment, the majority of traffic flows from north, north to south. And in order to reduce the number of switches and, of course, the costs, 
In our setup, the border leaf switches have been removed from the topology and collapsed with the spine switches into a single device, therefore resulting in a two-stage fabric. On the core facing side, there's the IP impellers backbone network speaking standard routing protocols like ISIS and BGP. The spine switches are fully integrated into our backbone network as PE routers holding the entire BGP routing table. On the other side, customers are connected via Amazon's OLTs or whatever access equipment, usually establishing PPPoE sessions to one of our leaf switches. There's also the need to provide layer two and layer three bitstream access uh, for other ISPs. In addition, we use standard protocols like radios for session authentication and accounting. Between the leap switches and spine switches, as Hannes already pointed out, we are relying on standard routing protocols, avoiding any proprietary fabric protocols or vendor lock-ins. All of these protocols need to be supported in the network operating system, of course. Um, that's clear. And last but not least, we have a controller in our pod, uh, which we call POW. Uh, this controller is running on a Kubernetes cluster, which provides services like orchestration, telemetry, data analysis, and also some kind of traffic steering. Uh, communication is done, again, by standard protocols like REST or gRPC or other similar protocols. Kirsten has earlier alluded to that uh, we started with uh, the classical cord approach and um, cord uh, really means that you have a sort of a um, controller who micromanages each and every flow. Now, uh, when we actually did the math and said, hey, on some of the larger central offices with uh, potential hundred thousands of subscribers, and uh, further assuming that um, for some of those services you have to program up to 80 uh, forwarding uh, related actions, uh, we could not really envision how uh, to size uh, the controller properly to manage that load. So therefore, uh, we have looked into uh, a way how to fuse together um, what uh, a central controller really provides uh, of information along with uh, what uh, uh, routing protocols uh, dynamically do discover. On the core facing side, uh, uh, no uh, big surprise here, uh, BGP and ISIS running. On the fabric side, uh, BGP LU as an underlay, L3 VPN as the overlay. And uh, up to this point, it actually looks like uh, an almost classic uh, setup, like it has been deployed for the past uh, two decades. Uh, where it is actually different is um, the controller may influence uh, a piece at a particular table here at the leaf, uh, which we call the service selection table, where we have... Um, a couple of uh, qualifiers and uh, also a couple of actions available. And uh, the STM controller uh, can tell exactly what to do with uh, any given uh, customer flow. So, for example, uh, we could say, hey, please terminate uh, VLAN 100, VLAN 200 on interface X, and uh, please, uh, I know uh, from OSS that this is. Um, a residential customer, so decapsulate PPPoE and do a route lookup in the internet worth. So this is the kind of uh, functionality that is available to uh, the service selection gateway. We have also made it uh, easier uh, for application developers, uh, for the crew who programs the power, the, our controller, um, to uh, basically uh, uh, install uh, remote state information, uh, like, um, for example, if uh, you terminate a service and you want to just shunt it off using an MPLS pseudo wire, you do not really need to set up uh, the underlay 
and uh, everything along that path, uh, you just need on both ends of the pseudo wire tell, hey, I want to relay here a certain VLAN stack over a particular MPLS service label. And uh, by the way, this is going to get terminated at uh, egress router with a certain IP address. Um, the uh, system then combines that with uh, the information that uh, have been discovered by the dynamic routing protocols and fuses together um, the um, service-related information from the controller with uh, what uh, decentralized leaves and spines uh, have uh, computed. Before we move moving into some more implementation-specific details, I want to briefly touch the bring-up of the Fabric Network switches. An important aspect of the Access 4.0 project is to automate as much as possible. All the pods look very much the same inside. Also, they might look differently from the outside world, but internally they look completely identical using predefined addressing schema based on private IPv6 addresses and private 4 byte AS numbers. The first step of the bring-up process is to automatically provide an IP address for management, uh, provide software images, and provide a basic configuration that allows us to build the underlay network. No surprise, we are using DHCP to get all this information to the box. But instead of using MAC addresses, um, which can easily be forged, we are using serial numbers to authenticate the device. The serial number of the box is stored in a database as part of the planning process. And once the switch is physically installed, the on-site engineer scans the barcode and the PAL, which are already talked about, then associates the switch with the right location and the right function. The switch is usually delivered with nothing else but an ONI installed on it. Uh, ONI stands for Open Network Install Environment and basically is a small Linux system that provides tools to automatically install a network operating system on a bare metal switch. The ONI includes a DHCP client to initially retrieve this IP address for management, and the DHCP reply message also includes a link to the download um, location for the correct software. In our case, the RTPIC full stack software. Um, the only takes care of the software installation process and afterwards automatically reboots the switch without any further interaction. Uh, once the switch is rebooted, again, it gets a management IP address via DHCP and also gets a link to download the configuration file, which will be retrieved and activated. And the nice thing about this approach is that we basically can include every white box switch into our network that supports ONI um, and has ONI pre-installed. The configuration file itself um, is also automatically provided. Uh, we have a configuration template for each switch role, in this case for the spine switches and for the leaf switches. And this template is more or less a JSON file with some variables uh, which can be filled. These variables are device specific and either um, get filled by planning data, like for instance, loopback addresses or so, or they get sometimes also uh, calculated from a given algorithm. So we have a, a predefined schema where we calculate certain variables from. And um, we have a template engine that um, uses this basic template and fills all the required data and then provides this configuration uh, to our CTP server ready for download by the switches. This template engine, uh, which does all the magic, is developed by Deutsche Telekom itself. However, the information needed to get the underlay network running is very little, as we will see in the next slide. OK, so let's have a look at the fabric underlay. The underlay network consists of spinal leaf switches, um, separating underlay from overlay services um, is um, very important for us uh, because it provides the possibility for multi-tenancy. 
Um, as an incumbent, we at Deutsche Telekom are forced by regulation to provide some kind of access to other ISPs. So um, having a separation of overlay and underlays in our infrastructure is very critical. The leaf switches are connected to all the spine switches with a symmetric number of links, uh, allowing equal cost multipath routing. Within the fabric itself, only external BGP is used as a control plane protocol. Uh, we are using MPLS as data plane encapsulation, where the signaling is done via standard segment routing extensions to BGP. Um, we have no need for any IGP protocol within the fabric. So usually IGPs are known for topology discovery, but in a spine leaf fabric, the topology is more or less known, so we can avoid this and can rely on BGP only. All the leaf switches have um, their own private AS number, uh, while the spine switches share a single AS number. Uh, you might be already familiar with this kind of design, so this is nothing special. In order to get the underlay routing running, uh, each switch needs a unique identifier, um, for instance, for the loopback address. So we have unique ID IDs for, for example, 11, 12 for the spine switches and 21, 22 for the leaf switches. Uh, we are not restricted to two spine switches, by the way. Uh, we can have even more, so no problem here. From this ID, we calculate all the other parameters for the underlay. For instance, the S number, the loopback addresses, the segment routing node sits, uh, and also various addresses for communication to the Kubernetes cluster I've already mentioned. Um, for example, uh, to communicate with the telemetry and the orchestrator and so on. The interesting part is the link between the switches. Uh, the links between spine and leaf switches only have an IPv6 link local address. So no need to do any configuration here. And once a leaf switch has been configured and the link between the leaf switch and the spine switch goes physically up, uh, the, spine, the leaf switch sorry, uh, tries to establish an EBGP session to the spine switch across the IPv6 uh, link local address. This is an event-based service implemented to overcome the lack of auto discovery and standard BGP. The spine switches are configured to accept BGP sessions from a predefined range of AS numbers. And for authentication, the TCP authentication option is used. Once the underlay is established, everything else is run as an MPS service on top of it. For example, standard layer 3 VPNs or layer 2 VPNs or eVPN. This is mainly done to provide multi-tenancy, as already mentioned. But it also provides a great deal of flexibility because we can easily support any new services by introducing appropriate BGP address families without changing the underlay at all. Let's consider our standard internet service as an example. The service is run as a dual stack layer free VPN across the fabric. The service signaling is done via BGP VPN v4 and VPN v6 address families. Remember the next top are labeled IPv6 addresses, as explained in the previous slide. The spine switches will handle all the routing needed for fabric internal communication, as well as communication to the backbone network. So the spine switches will have the full internet routing table within the internet VRF. The leaf switches, on the other hand, will have all the PVP subscriber-related routing information. This includes uh, usually free addresses or free prefixes, one slash 32 IPv4 prefix, one slash 64 IPv6 prefix, and a delegated prefix per subscriber. In order to reduce the load um, and also prevent routing flaps, leaf switches will only advertise pool prefixes to the spines and hide all the subscriber-specific details. On the other hand, the spine switches will only advertise default routes to the leaf switches, as the leaf switches um, know that they only have upstream connectivity through the spine switches anyway. So let's have a look at the backbone connectivity. The spine switches are physically connected to our P routers, LSRs, of the MP IP MPLS network. The inter internet service runs on the spine switches as a kind of MPLS layer 3 VPN 
This implies that all the backbone facing protocols run as PEC routing protocols within the Internet VPN instance. The IPM Palace Backbone Network delivers its service based on BGP over IPv4. Internet BGP sessions are established to multiple autoflectors for redundancy. Services include IPv4 Internet, IPv6 Internet, which is implemented as 6P service, as well as traditional layer 2 and layer 3 VPNs. For the MPLS transport, ISS level 1 routing is used to connect to the LSRs. Label distribution is done via segment routing extensions. We have used LDP in the past, but with this project, we're only using segment routing. This, kind, this is kind of tricky as uh, there are not many implementations on the market that support running labeled IS, IS as a PEC routing protocol. Uh, one thing to highlight is that in order to reduce the number of segment routing node SITs in the backbone network, the spine switches share an anycast node SIT, which is advertised to the core network and which is used as a BGP next stop for all the BGP MPLS services. And this has also the benefit that we can scale to more than two switches without increasing the load in the IPM PLS backbone, as they just appear as a single device from an ISIS perspective. We've already explained that everything in the fabric is implemented as a service. So multicast, which is used for IPTV, is just another example for such a service. Because we are substituting a black box BNG device, we cannot change any interface that is outside of Fabric. So customers still signal their interest in receiving a specific multicast channel via IGMP version 2 to the leaf switches. IGMP version 2 requests, by the way, are sent within an existing PPP session. So no separate channel here. On the other side, the Backbone Network uses PIM to signal multicast today maybe MLDP in the future. Within the fabric, multicast is implemented as a next generation MVPN service. Again, you see the pattern, we are relying on the BGP protocol. The leaf switches convert the IGMP joints to a specific multicast and send BGP source join, source join messages towards the spine switches, which themselves convert these messages to the protocol used in the backbone. As we have only one hierarchy of leaf switches, the spine switches need to replicate the multicast traffic for each leaf switch. Setting up point to multi point LSPs does not bring any benefits from a data plane perspective, but only increases the complexity of the control plane. So we've chosen to use increase replication on the spine switches for the sake of simplicity. The leaf switches will take care of the multicast replication to the individual subscribers. So now we had the challenge of uh, developing an entire NOS stack uh, in support of all those protocols. And an entire NOS stack um, essentially means infrastructure, APIs, CLI, data plane code, uh, build a test harness around it and get it uh, production ready. How did we do it? Um, we have started with uh, the core idea of a distributed data store that uh, can handle even cruel BGP workloads of uh, hundreds of millions of BGP paths and focused a lot on getting the transaction performance here right up to 2 million transactions per CPU core. Since Every daemon in the system needs also to share state uh, with one another. We had to also ensure that we can utilize uh, the maximum memory bandwidth uh, between CPU cores. And as such, really only that memory bandwidth is the limit uh, using shared memory sockets. You may ask yourself why we did not really start with uh, good uh, popular open source backstores, for example, like Redis. Um, and I can tell you, we looked at uh, uh, most of what was available at the time, but um, in 2016, there was no uh, good multi-threading support for Redis. And uh, also the clustering support was in a very early stage 
uh, uh, mostly lacking end-to-end -end integrity uh, uh, protocol support here. Now, that uh, ubiquitous data store concept uh, has also fundamentally changed how we have built routing and access protocols on top of that. Think about that every protocol gets broken down to uh, a, table, a table schema for um, holding its peers, adjacencies, link state databases, ribbon, ribouts, subscriber table, statistics, even logs. So everything really gets reduced to a table schema. Now, by reducing everything to a few uh, transaction uh, to a database and a clearly defined table schema, one can auto-generate um, an API and uh, read, write every attribute in that table and sometimes really look uh, inside a particular protocol's implementation. Um, that thing is not only tremendously useful for operations uh, because nothing gets really uh, hidden. Uh, it also helps developers, uh, testers, and customer validation teams uh, to build together jointly uh, regression and validation test cases. Um, it is fair to say that the idea of uh, the backstore plus uh, the auto-generated API has really established here uh, a common language almost uh, uh, between the developers and also uh, here are uh, customers uh, doing all the pre-qualification of the software. Now, uh, what we have built underneath uh, that data store is also a very large module. Uh, we call that uh, a forwarding abstraction, forwarding hierarchy dependency manager, which is a bit of a, uh, a large name. Uh, a short uh, terminology here is RIP and 50 uh, It is essentially a, a, a standard um, way to expose uh, certain primitives, um, primitives like uh, interfaces, routes, next hops, to expose uh, slicing concepts like uh, VRFs, uh, virtual forwarding tables, um, model uh, various tunneling protocols, MPLS, MPLS, pseudo-wire, uh, PPPoE, L2DP. Uh, there is also a standard abstraction for uh, matching rules. We have mentioned service selection uh, before. We mostly try to break that down into uh, chip level TCAM lookups, counters, and uh, HCOS. What uh, this uh, uh, piece of software does also, it tries to figure out and compile all the various um, uh, information from various layers. So if the SDN controller has instantiated, let's say, a pseudo wire, and then BGP LU has discovered a fabric route, and uh, in order to resolve, uh, we are relying on the ARP ND, uh, response from a neighbor, uh, all those information we call a forwarding chain. And once a forwarding chain is ready, uh, it is resolvable. Uh, we actually uh, pour out individual uh, chip level instructions. So underneath uh, that uh, big gray bar, there is uh, forwarding plugins. We've started here with uh, uh, FDIL uh, x86 uh, code, uh, mostly um, to um, in the proof of concept phase of the company. Then later on, uh, we have uh, built uh, a full BNG on uh, Barefoot Tofino. But as Karsten has mentioned, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on traffic management capabilities, hierarchical, age cost, policing, shaping, all of that. And uh, uh, DT Network Engineering has here found uh, the Broadcom DNX uh, product line, particularly Jericho and Jericho 2, a good fit. Now, 
all of that uh, software gets bundled in, I would say, totally now uh, roughly 20 uh, different daemons, uh, which run as a systemd service uh, inside uh, a, a Linux container. Um, the Linux container is a standard LXC uh, 2.0 container running a uh, uh, unchanged, almost unchanged version of uh, Ubuntu uh, 18.04. And um, our um, daemons, our software packages, all run in user space and um, are integrated in uh, Ubuntu's uh, packet manager. So uh, upgrading a piece of software um, works exactly like uh, you would do it on uh, the Ubuntu server. Outside of that uh, LXC container uh, on the host OS, uh, we have a small container runtime uh, of ours, which has been built around mostly LXD 2.0. What it does is uh, simply starting, stopping containers, loading container images, um, graceful shutdown and insertion uh, of components, uh, making sure that all the software components inside uh, are running, so it tracks keep alive signatures, uh, but uh, also um, uh, does, um, of course, handle software upgrades and downgrades. Our model is very simple. Uh, there it may be several containers um, stored on the switch. However, only one will be running. That is usually the one that uh, uh, controls the forwarding hardware. Um, the container runtime also is uh, our universal um, API gateway uh, into the container. So whatever um, uh, external protocol, you want to access the switch, and there's plenty of those, starting from, uh, uh, of course, SSH, Tech Plus for authentication, uh, uh, REST uh, uh, calls of all sorts of flavors, uh, OAuth. Um, so uh, all of those things are here also implemented in the container runtime. The idea is uh, we have just a single endpoint where uh, we can talk um, mostly using standard-based protocols, even outright open source packages. The BDS data store uh, for us is a single source of truth. Um, we retrieve all the state um, in and out uh, from the table. Um, it is not just uh, a standalone uh, key value store. It is also um, a plugin server. So um, maybe you're familiar with uh, the Redis uh, database able to run uh, Lua scripts. Uh, we have added here the capability to load any particular uh, shared library, any particular symbol. And uh, what we can do here and what we do is uh, for every uh, table that we define, we can actually define here uh, a couple of stored procedure symbols. And if um, um, an object gets inserted in that table, that code is getting invoked. And it doesn't really matter um, you know, how uh, the element, uh, how the object gets into the system, uh, whether it's coming from an API or uh, from an embedded uh, uh, TCP IP stack uh, or uh, from our own uh, plugin code. In fact, um, the whole state flow uh, within the system is being modeled after, uh, hey, some object gets installed in the table, and this triggers some plugin code, which again publishes and reconciles several information into another table. Um, I have prepared here uh, a small example that should just uh, uh, get you the idea uh, how a simple route flow works in the system. Let's Take, for example, uh, a producer of routing information like um, the BGP uh, a rib out uh, piece of software. 
So usually what it does is after uh, learning its um, routing information, doing best path selection policy and all of that, it publishes the information in a, a worth specific uh, table along with, uh, and it holds references uh, along to a particular next hop uh, table, which is shared across routing instances. Of course, uh, if there is ICMP, there is also the possibility to group several next hops together in next hop sets uh, up to uh, 256 uh, ECMP neighbors, whatever uh, the local forwarding hardware does support. So now, um, uh, the next component, uh, which is the RIP manager, subscribes to those tables. Um, uh, reads uh, all the um, FIP local tables from ISIS, BGP, um, even access, right? Uh, and uh, consiles uh, what is the best uh, uh, route source in case there is an overlap. Now something interesting happens, right? Uh, now uh, the best path uh, or the best protocol gets selected along with uh, a given forwarding chain. And this can be multiple levels of uh, route resolution. And if uh, it is possible to uh, resolve a particular route chain, it finally ends up here in that uh, global RIPD adjacency table. Now, all the lower uh, forwarding tables um, in the forwarding complex subscribe to that table and actually construct uh, their uh, local forwarding tables from that. Um, so in a typical switch, uh, we always have two. We have a hardware plugin and we have also FDIO, uh, which we use for sending and receiving the L3 traffic. So what we do here is uh, for every route object, uh, there is uh, a local uh, API out table. And uh, we use those API out tables uh, for uh, doing uh, very granular bookkeeping, what actually did went uh, to, let's say, a third party. Uh, code base. So, for example, for VPP, what have been all those uh, VPP API route calls and also um, the result codes. Similar thing here also in Jericho 2. Uh, every entry in that API out table uh, actually translates into an SDK call and um, uh, we store also the result from that. Um, that sort of uh, setup uh, has really um, established uh, making quick progress uh, for hardware integration because you can very easily troubleshoot where a certain um, uh, route or next stop uh, um, uh, in the route flow got broken because you uh, have almost like uh, a life log uh, plus all the history what has happened here. And uh, this, uh, again, allows uh, for uh, quick troubleshooting and uh, nailing issues. The concept of a central data store um, also um, is a bit uh, the dream of uh, networking operation folks. Um, one thing uh, that we had to fix early on is uh, the question of scaling. Now think about, uh, let's say, Carson has mentioned there is thousands of uh, uh, modular-based uh, routers. And if you break it down into uh, a disaggregated versions, uh, one thing is certain, right? It's going to be more than one, right? Uh, so potentially, um, there might be you know, eight, nine, ten thousands uh, of individual switches. Now, um, how do you actually monitor those switches? How do you uh, keep track uh, uh, of uh, inter interesting parameters and all of that? Uh, we did not really feel comfortable by uh, actually pulling uh, data from up to 10,000 switches from uh, a centralized uh, collector infrastructure because um, 
um, you know, pulling uh, up to a 400 time series table and uh, retaining it for an extended amount of time uh, consumes a lot of storage, uh, which uh, we didn't really uh, put a whole lot of investment in. So we thought, hey, why not really uh, build here uh, the telemetry solution as part of the switch OS. After all, it is um, a standard Ubuntu-based installation, so we can just take uh, an open source uh, time series database like Prometheus, and uh, we have integrated that, uh, that we can do high frequency samples uh, of every scalar uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, in the individual daemons in the BDS uh, data store. And um, uh, Prometheus is, is uh, much more than just um, uh, a, a scraper uh, for a time series database. It also has a very nifty um, uh, math core where you can generate, where you can derive uh, certain sessions. So we can actually on the switch pre-produce things like, hey, uh, let's sample uh, the aggregate bandwidth on all the access interfaces and divide it uh, by the number of logged in subscribers and uh, um, pass that uh, time series uh, further upstream and uh, federate. So we can actually do pre-aggregation in uh, for telemetry. And uh, this gets me to the end of um, uh, my uh, part of this talk, and I handle back to Carson, uh, which uh, will give you uh, a summary and wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, wrapping up, we have managed to develop and build a disaggregation, disaggregate route on BNC, BNG system and uh, got it up and running in our production network at the end of 2020. Disaggregation of network equipment means that you have to deal with a lot more individual components than before, as Hannes already mentioned. Um, this means that you can only do this using automation and therefore principles, that's for sure. Um, however, on the other side, splitting up hardware and software allows a much faster life cycle and also much faster time to market. Thanks for your attention. Hello, thank you, Harshan and Hannes again. Um, we have a few questions for you, and it looks like you have been active in the Q&A, uh, answering questions as we go. Um, so let me see what questions, are there questions here that, we're not, that you haven't answered in the chat? Um, or if there's if there's any questions in here that you'd like to elaborate on, uh, I see a question about using OEM vendors. Sorry, do did you use the OEM vendors routing stack on this fabric switches or others? Yeah, we don't. So uh, basically, the only component software component from the OEM vendor we are using is uh, the ONE. The ONE. Um, I mean, this is an open source project, but Normally, the vendor has to do some slight uh, adjustments to it, but that's the only component from the OEM vendor we're using. Okay. Um, question, are you multi-homing your leaves? Uh, looks like you've answered that in the chat, but if you'd like to elaborate. Uh, yes, we are using EcoCost multipath routing, so we are multi-homing the leaves to equally to all the spine switches. In our case, at the moment, that's two spine switches, but yeah, it's it's okay. equally. Okay. And uh, a follow-up question uh, is: I was more interested in multi-homed EVPN. It's a single device connection to a port over EVPN, or is there multiple devices in EVPN? Uh, so for the time being, we do not have any redundancy in the access. So usually a subscriber, meaning uh, being connected on OLT or Amazon, is only single homed to uh, to one leaf switch at the moment. So we are thinking about doing redundancy for business subscribers in the future, but as of now, they are not multi-homed. 
Okay. Uh, there's a question about um, insure about software versions. I wonder from Jordan Santano. I wonder how you ensure the software version of each component of the stack is up to date. Are you using an open source solution to maintain the software components, or a commercial tool from a vendor or various vendors? Um, yeah. The point is. As I explained, we, we do have a, a central component running on a Kubernetes cluster uh, within the, uh, the pod, uh, which we call POW, pod access con uh, orchestrator. And that component keeps track of all the software versions and, if necessary, initiates the rollout of new software. And, and this part of software is developed by Deutsche Telekom uh, itself. So this is not an open source project right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks like there's one more question from Matt Petak. Uh, if you have Prometheus running on each device to collect and graph the stats, do you have a system for pulling that data from the individual switches back into a central dashboard or dashboard slash monitoring system? Um, maybe I can take that. Um, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, the high resolution data um, actually stays on the switch, right? Uh, but there is actually a centralized uh, uh, instance of Prometheus, uh, which actually takes uh, the sample down uh, uh, version of those time series, such that you have got some uh, scaling benefits. Okay. Great. Um, Another question just came in from Boris Kasanov. Do you use any kind of TE between the fabric and the backbone, such as SRTE? Uh, as much as we would love the technology, right? Uh, uh, actually, uh, just adding bandwidth uh, uh, is uh, <laughs> the easier thing. And uh, essentially, within the fabric, uh, bandwidth almost comes for free, right? Uh, so, um, no, uh, right now, we don't use TE. There was a, a mul OLT multi homing. Was that an answer? Okay, that was your answer to a question about PIM SSM. For PIM, do you use PIM SSM? Budget. We're using specific, so specific multicast. Okay. Okay. Um, if there are, are there, first off, are there any other questions? Um, and give me a few seconds. I don't see any more questions in the queue. Actually, hold off. I just saw a question pop up uh, from Sanjay Kumar Pangonkar. I hope I got your pronunciation properly. Are you using BNG and router software development by different vendors, or are you using something else? Uh, I didn't get the question completely. Yes. What are the BNG software and uh, the routing software is from different vendors? No, not at the moment. So right now we are using the the, the software from RT Brick. Excellent. Uh, we are out of time, but uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for your time answering questions. Mm -hmm.